Hello and welcome to today's webinar focusing on opioid addiction and the challenges and opportunities to using buprenorphine with populations who are homeless. My name is Barbara DiPietro and I'm the Senior Policy Director with the Council. I'll be acting as moderator for today's webinar. Please note that this webinar is supported through a cooperative agreement with the Health Resources and Services Administration at HHS. This session is being recorded. It's a one-hour presentation. We'll try to reserve the last 10 minutes or so uh, for Q&A. You'll see below the presentation slide, there's a chat box for participant questions and technical issues. Please type your questions or any issues you might be having into that chat box at any time during the presentation, and we'll either address as many as we can during the discussion or save them for the end. Um, if you're having technical issues, please contact the Council's office at 615-226-2292 and ask to speak to Caroline. Uh, this PowerPoint presentation and a recording of the webinar will be posted to our website within a few working days, and a link to that will be emailed to anyone who registered for this event. So at this point, I really want to introduce our speakers today. We've got a fantastic panel lined up. Uh, at our Baltimore Healthcare for the Homeless Project, we have Dr. Nilesh Kalyanaraman, who is the Chief Health Officer, as well as Terry Clark, who is the Addictions Counselor there. And at Central City Concern, the HCH project in Portland, Oregon, we have Dr. Brianna Sostersik uh, and Brian Barnes. Uh, Brianna is the Senior Medical Director of Primary Care, and Brian is the Clinical Supervisor. Uh, and again, I'm Barbara DiPietro, and I'll be serving as the moderator. Uh, so let's get started with the discussion. You should have noticed that there's a policy brief that the Council had just published. There was a link to that really going through some of the strategies, challenges of uh, doing buprenorphine uh, for homeless populations. But really a lot of this is why are we even focusing on this issue at this time? And I think anyone reading the newspapers would know that there's a growing recognition that opioid addiction is a focus for our healthcare system at this point. We know that for vulnerable populations, people like people experiencing homelessness, this has really been a long-term issue. This is not new. Um, but we're seeing a lot more attention being given to this issue nationally, and so we welcome that. And at the same time, we really want to think about, you know, how are homeless adults um, really particularly vulnerable to some of the issues uh, overwhelm overwhelmingly more likely to die of overdose? And you see it from a Boston study that there was nine times more likely to die than their house peers. So this is a particularly vulnerable group that we want to pay attention to. And certainly addiction in this population has always been a disparity from, again, other people who are otherwise low income, but how? So really want to think about how HCH providers are very well versed in providing this kind of treatment, addiction treatment to homeless populations, and particularly buprenorphine treatment. So we want to think about how we can really adopt some of those best practices and lessons learned uh, throughout the industry. Also noting CDC data, um, looking at how this has really been an increasing issue. The previous chart showed prescription drug opioid addiction has actually outpaced heroin overdoses. Um, but then thinking about when we even look at low-income groups, you can see in the red box here, uh, low-income groups uh, also seeing a, sig a significant increase over the past few years, but we're seeing increases in all income groups. And so, um, this is the kind of thing, again, where people who have experience can really think about how are we um, addressing this and how can those lessons learned be extrapolated through the system. I uh, just want to do a, like, a little quick background to cover some of the information that's in the policy brief and just thinking through what is medication-assisted treatment, or MAT. Um, this is intended to be a medication that assists treatment, and so thinking about counseling um, and behavioral health therapies in conjunction with um, the prescription and the medication and thinking about how those go together. And in practice, sometimes there are some challenges in making that work well, so we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, buprenorphine obviously only being one um, approach to a MAT uh, treatment, and so, but um, one that is particularly geared toward a primary care environment, and so this is really what was designed for. And this is where particularly from health centers, uh, this is something that allows us to integrate this into traditional primary care treatment. When we think about changes that have been happening and how the nation is addressing opioids, there's been a number of different changes in the recent um, months. Uh, congressionally, they did uh, pass and the President signed the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, and this was just last month. 
uh, only partially funded at this point, but it really made some significant changes. In particular, one of the things that we're excited about is that it expands the prescribing rights to nurse practitioners and physician assistants. And I think that this is something that we've really been pushing for, something that obviously would help expand access to care, and something that helps um, really push uh, suboxone or, or buprenorphine treatment uh, into a broader range of settings. So that's really exciting. And I think we're also starting to see a shift in the country and the way the policy perspectives come from is rather than criminalizing addiction, we're starting to move toward treating addiction and recognizing addiction as a disease. This is a uh, something that we are very excited to see finally starting to happen. We're starting to see the tide turn there. Again, this is something that we've been working with for a long, long time. Um, but this was one piece uh, into many changes that need to happen in the way that our healthcare system ac accommodates this type of treatment. Uh, at the same time, the administration has been taking its steps as well to increase access to care. So the administration and HHS released also last month raising the MAT patient caps from 100 to 275. So that's a welcome um, increase in removing some of those barriers. Uh, HRSA has continued to make health center grants, expansion, service expansion grants available around substance abuse and, mental, and other behavioral health therapies like mental health. That's been very exciting. Uh, SAMHSA is continuing to put out grants to in, increase the training associated with um, substance use disorders and expanding medication-assisted treatment. And we're starting to see a lot of states put in place different prescribing rules for how opioids uh, can be prescribed for how long and in what kind of um, volume, and at the same time looking at how we're changing the training uh, available to um, clinicians who are working with this population. So that's also very exciting. Again, lots of different changes need to happen, but we are seeing some good things uh, be put in place. We'll talk today about a number of challenges to providing MAT. Just a, these, this is a, a short list here that we talk about in our policy brief. Uh, I talked a little bit about training. Again, one of the primary barriers we're seeing in the general population is that primary care providers just don't have the training in addiction medicine to really be comfortable doing buprenorphine treatment. And so how we increase that can really help overcome that barrier to care. Um, at the same time, too, when we think about health centers, we always have to think about the capacity that we have to be able to either see more patients or to see the same number of patients but do more for them and increase the depth of services. And so thinking through how do we stretch what we're doing to be able to accommodate the need. Diversion and misuse of medication has really been a problem, uh, an issue that's been looked at as a problem in our public policy discussions. Uh, we're going to have a focused discussion on diversion today uh, with our guest speakers, so uh, let's mark that to come back to. Um, we're also seeing every state's Medicaid system is very different, particularly in states that have expanded Medicaid. Uh, we know there's still 19 states that have not, but it may increase the rate of insurance and the ability to pay for treatment, but we still know that there are a number of hurdles to engaging in that treatment or accessing treatment or continuing in care once treatment's been started. So uh, certainly goes without saying that states that have not expanded Medicaid uh, have an additional barrier to accessing substance use treatment. And then in addition to that, when we think about populations who are homeless, there's a number of specific characteristics that make engaging in care even, even harder. So obviously the lack of stability that comes along with being homeless and engaging in care, transportation, uh, being able to adhere to a daily care plan when you might be living under a bridge or in a shelter or in a place that's very unstable, a place where you may not have medications that can either be safely stored or at risk of being lost or stolen. These are the kinds of things that really um, complicate care for, for homeless populations. And at the same time, too, folks who don't have stable housing are going to be focused on basic daily needs. Where are they going to lay their head tonight? Where are they going to get food? And how do they ensure their safety? So these are some of the things that we really need to think about as primary um, just human needs. And so when we think about how to craft a care plan that's going to meet those realities, there's a certain level of sensitivity to those realities that we have to make. And then again, um, vulnerable populations come with a whole host of health care conditions. And so um, addiction and uh, this medication-assisted treatment doesn't occur in a vacuum. People bring with them a whole host of chronic and acute conditions 
that you also need to balance what does that look like in conjunction with diabetes care or hypertension management or working with someone's behavioral health uh, treatment in other regards. So these are the things that we really need to fold in together. Um, talking about overcoming those challenges and what provider practices have worked, we're going to talk a lot more in this webinar, so I won't um, uh, dwell here, about approaches to care and what really works well, um, what are the lessons learned, and how can we share that again with each other in this team. Um, but a lot of that you'll see reflected here. And I think primary, of course, can't go without saying, but establishing stability in housing is going to be the baseline for a goal. Uh, it's very hard to engage in recovery and stay in recovery when your housing is very unstable. Uh, but we'll talk a lot about those approaches to care uh, here in a few minutes. Some of the policy recommendations, so we get a lot of this comes with policy and practice embedded together. Um, and so some of the things that we know still need to change, removing patient caps altogether and treating this as any other medication. Uh, buprenorphine is one of, one of the few prescribed medications that's as highly regulated as it is. Um, expanding prescribing rights, we talked a little bit about how that's um, been, been fixed with the federal law, so that's exciting. Um, but we, of course, can't ignore the irony, too, that there's a lot of requirements for training to prescribing buprenorphine, but not as many requirements, actually, to prescribing Oxycontin and some of the opioid prescription drugs that, uh, that cause some of the addiction to begin with. I think we're starting to see a growing recognition that there's a bit of, a, of, of an inverse attention there, and so we're seeing that be uh, um, fixed in some places. But again, we really need to think more holistically about how we're doing training for primary care providers on all opioid prescription drugs. Uh, parity laws such as prior authorizations, uh, really thinking through what that looks like uh, in all states, those are real barriers to care. Uh, reducing stigma and treating addiction as a disease. We know we've been fighting this for a long, long time, uh, and I think continuing to work in this regard, again, looking at addiction as a disease and something that's treated in the healthcare environment and not in, in, uh, in the justice system would really be helpful. Uh, and of course, expanding prevention and treatment programs is something that we've long been uh, advocating for. Uh, so that's just a quick overview of the policy brief that we put together. We hope that that's a good resource for you. But at this point, I'd like to stop talking, and I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues in Baltimore uh, who can talk to us a little bit about their program. So uh, Nilesh and Terry, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to uh, talk to you, uh, talk to us about Baltimore. Thank you, Barbara. This is Nilesh. Um, uh, as, as Barbara was mentioning, you know, we, we uh, We've had we've had a lot of attention placed on Baltimore in terms of in terms of the opioid crisis here, opioid addiction and overdose crisis here. Um, we're we're a healthcare for the homeless only clinic. We're an SPHC serving over 10,000 people a year, um, and have three primary care clinics in in Baltimore: one in uh, downtown, one in West Baltimore, and one in Baltimore County. And we offer a, a wide range of services: medical, behavioral health dental, nursing, case management, outreach, supportive housing. And it's really critical to be able to offer all of these services because folks who are coming in for substance use disorder issues don't have just that as their problem. We know there's a high instance of co-occurring mental health disorder, but there's also a lot of other issues, and it's really hard to treat a problem. Um, and that really gets to our treatment philosophy, which is being person-centered and looking at how we're taking care of all of the needs of folks. And Terry and I will talk a little bit more about how we do that. Um, being trauma-informed um, is, a, is a key aspect of our care um, that it permeates all that we do. And I think one of the, one of the key aspects in, in when we're talking about medication-assisted treatment is how harm reduction, um, how harm reduction really enters into this conversation. You know, we've had this long-running um, long-running long discussion here about how harm, what, what does harm reduction look like? Our ultimate goal is for folks to be substance-free, um, but what does the path look like? What, you know, when you apply harm reduction philosophies, if somebody's using two or three substances, getting rid of one is a great step. How do you, how do you reinforce that and keep people moving along towards getting rid of that second one or that third one? Um, and then, and then lastly, working in multidisciplinary care teams, and that's something that we, you know, that we've um, 
that we've really embraced here, and that's really the core of how we're doing the medication-assisted treatment. Um, so right now, you know, we have um, three medication-assisted treatment groups that are serving 60 people actively who are in a in a um, initiation and maintenance phase. And overall, in the past year, we've served over 500 people through uh, medication-assisted treatment. And so I'm going to turn it over to Terry at this point to talk more about our program and how it works. Hi, this is uh, Terry. Next slide, please. Okay, hello. This is Terry. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about entering care as the client comes in for treatment. And again, as you can see, there's no wrong doors. Uh, the client can either come in through medical or through addiction. Uh, we refer addiction so we can assess the client, make sure the client is eligible for buprenorphine. We also take a, a quick screen to make sure the client has something in their system because some people may come in and don't have anything in their system and still want buprenorphine. We do a quick screen and a, and a, a abuse stick and to find out if the client was even on abuse. Some clients don't come in doing opiates except for just the and morphine. They get off the street, so we still can like service them also. So we work hand-in-hand -hand with medical, and how the addiction team does it is that we'll flag a medical doctor and set up an appointment for the client, or well, vice versa. If the client goes to the uh, medical provider first, the medical provider will flag addiction. Some of the team is usually myself or Rick Baxton, and we would do the assessment from there. And that's how we determine whether or not the client is really eligible for treatment. And then we, from there, we take care of everything else. And we'll find out the client needs mental health, mental health care. We feel as though if the client does need mental health care, that giving them buprenorphine alone is not going to solve any issues. But they, uh, the other issues that they have are nine times out of ten, they're, not going, to, they're going to misuse buprenorphine. So we want to get them mentally stable also, if necessary, get them uh, on medication. Our case management team that we refer them to usually is to get ID, birth certificates, social security cards, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and also may work on some type of housing, whether it's transitional housing, Section 8, or maybe even a, a decent shelter they may go into. So we, we try to do everything to keep the client comfortable. Uh, one of the things that I do want to say right now about case management, and why that's so important, a lot of our clients are homeless. And they get their scripts, and, and uh, like I said, when they first came in, they get a week's supply, and they are at vulnerable risk of being robbed or losing their scripts. So we try to want to get them some type of stable housing that they can stay in. And of course, they see nursing, make sure that their vital signs and everything is good, dental. Supportive housing, again, that's, that's very uh, important because, again, that's trying to help them become more stabilized so they can be off the street. Uh, we're blessed to have an on-site pharmacy next door where we can send the scripts in right away and the, and the clients can pick them up. And uh, so we're blessed to have that. And then we have the naloxone the training that we do provide here at ACH to our clients and staff that if they're around someone the OD, that they can uh, quickly go in and administer that to them. So that's basically how we enter care here at Healthcare for the Homeless. Next slide. Once again, this is Terry. Uh, initiating treatment. Uh, again, we uh, our treatment agreement. We talk to the client. They must come to a MAC group, whether it's on a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. Uh, how we have it set up is that they come to four meetings, four groups, and if they do well within the four groups, and doing well uh, means that they see their counselor, they give a quick, they give a urine a weekly, and they just provide clean urine. Uh, then they can move to every two weeks, and then from there, once monthly. So that's how we kind of do that. And um, pretty good because we've had some, some success, which I would say was pretty good success here at doing that. The PDM, uh, MP review, um, the prescription drug monitoring program. Uh, we Actually, we do that. We do monitor our clients. With the prescriptions that we give them, we make sure that they get the correct prescriptions. We make sure that it goes into the proper place. So again, we got a pharmacy next door. Some clients don't like to wait next door, so they'll take their prescriptions elsewhere. But for the most part, we do pretty good at monitoring prescriptions. Uh, most of our clients have taken buprenorphine in the past. Um, 
for some odd reason they had gotten off and they relapsed, they come back and get back on buprenorphine. And usually the second or third time around they really have success with that. Uh, we make sure that the, we watch this and manage the induction once they in withdrawal, make sure the client can, is receptible to the uh, buprenorphine. And again, we have daily group meetings. Uh, most of our clients come into our IOP program, which is five days a week from 9 to 11 uh, weekly. But they also do one day, which would be 9 to 11 in the MAC group. But this is consistently on a daily, week-to-week -week basis. Our individual counseling sessions are done weekly. Uh, we do our group, our session with the counselor. It's very important that we get a uh, weekly join from the counselor, from the client, and uh, discuss any issues that they may be going into. Again, one of the main issues, again, is that our clients are mainly homeless, so we try to find a stable place for them to stay. And, again, the weekly MAC groups for Buford Morphine, they do the weekly grab MAC groups, again, it's three days a week, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And again, we usually have like 20 people per group. Uh, that's basically it for me. Next slide. And so, you know, there's three real things that happen when um, when folks initiate into MAP. Um, the first week or two, some people drop out, um, unfortunately, and it's hard to know why. For a, lot, for a lot of the folks, they do make it through. They don't usually make it through in the two weeks. That was sort of the ideal. Um, but they make it through, meaning that they, they're they showing that they're consistently drug-free. Um, and Terry and I have conversations about drug, all drugs or just opioids. Um, and really, the buprenorphine is meant to treat the opioids only. Um, when folks are stable on that, there's no need for the MAT group, for the medication assisted treatment group, but they still may require, if they're still using cocaine or other drugs, they may still require continued intensive substance use services. Um, what we do what we do with folks like that is we tend to we tend to refer them to a higher level of care. Or if they're not or if they're not able to um, uh, stop using opiates, opioids, um, even while they're on the buprenorphine, we'll refer them to a higher level of care. For those who are doing well, we'll transition them to a primary care provider or a psychiatrist, and it really depends upon their um, upon their other other needs. So for for folks who are really actively engaged with psychiatry for any number of reasons, we'll transition their buprenorphine to that to that way, or we'll transition them to the to the physicians who are doing primary care. We also have nurse practitioners who. Um, will co-manage these patients with, uh, with the MDs. As Barbara had mentioned earlier, it's really a great thing that nurse practitioners will be able to prescribe this. There's nothing magical about this medication as opposed to any other medication that is being prescribed. Um, and so right now what we do is we'll have folks who, are, who have uh, one of the nurse practitioners as their, um, as their primary care, we'll send them back to that, to that uh, nurse practitioner for continued care, and then they'll have I'll work with an MD just to write the Suboxone script, but in that way we can maintain continuity of care. Um, and then, and then, you know, continuing individual therapy and or counseling is really critical for continued success. And I think the most important part of this is medication assisted. It's not that the medication is the magic bullet. It's, and I, I say this to, I say this to our clients all the time. This is probably the easiest part of it for me, but. It's but it's really just one small piece of it. It's the ongoing ability to, um, to manage your other conditions and things like a dual diagnosis group where you're trying to manage your mental health and your substance abuse issues simultaneously um, are really critical to helping people stay off of drugs um, as they cope with the stressors in their lives. Um, and so that's kind of a, a brief rundown of how we take people from beginning to end of, um, or not end, but the maintenance in their uh, in their path on, on medication system treatment. I'll turn it back over to you, Barbara. Thank you. Um, and so at this point, um, that was a, a good synopsis of what uh, the program looks like in Baltimore. And let's hear from our partners in Portland about what their program looks like. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Um, thanks. We're really excited. Um, to be here today to talk to you about our program um, and you know listening to um, the Baltimore program we definitely share uh, many similarities um, 
Um, but just to tell you a little bit about our clinic, so Old Town Clinic is a uh, healthcare for the homeless, FQHC. We are um, a patient-centered medical home, and um, we are housed within a larger social services agency um, of Central City Concern. So within a larger social services agency, um, there are um, housing services, other um, health services, and addiction treatments within um, the larger agency. There's also employment services and things like that. So we definitely have the benefit of, um, of uh, using those larger sort of wraparound services for our clients um, as well. Uh, we serve about uh, close to 5,000 patients per year, uh, and we also work on uh, multidisciplinary care teams. Um, and integrated behavioral health is really um, you know, so important for really the overall uh, health care of our patients, but in particular uh, for patients who suffer from addiction. Um, and our overall treatment philosophy is that we strive to provide low barrier, patient-centered, and holistic care. So we don't only um, offer allopathic medi uh, medicine, but we do have um, naturopathic providers and acupuncture and wellness groups and things like that, which also comes in um, pretty handy when we're treating our folks who um, suffer from substance use disorders. Um, and then we're going to kind of tag team it here with me and Brian, so Brian's going to Okay, hi, this is Brian. And regarding our uh, medication-assisted treatment philosophy, we believe that it's most effective when offered as part of a comprehensive treatment program, as has al already been mentioned. Uh, we specifically include the medication counseling with group and individual, and then community support. We believe that's a large part of a person's recovery is having uh, a group of people that they connect with and can rely upon, uh, whether that's in housing or other services. Uh, our substance use disorder treatment is fully integrated into primary care, or at least as fully integrated as we know to define it at this time. Um, what that means is that we have a complete um, comprehensive treatment program, an enrollment in, an, in a substance use disorder treatment program that begins with assessment and goes through the continuum of care. We are available for warm handoffs with providers. I know a lot of people define warm handoffs differently. What that means to us is that a medical provider is in a session with a patient. They see a need for some additional information regarding potential treatment or referral or resourcing. They'll call one of us in, as a counselor in, and if then there's a referral to be made to us for treatment, we, we can have that. And it just sort of reduces some of the stigma and helps with the education and goes through a lot of the things that were mentioned as needs. Uh, we have a range of substance use disorder treatment groups that we do, including dual diagnosis, pain management, a wellness group for all patients to the clinic called Understanding Addiction. They don't need to be enrolled in the program, but they can come learn about addiction. Uh, and then we have weekly case consultations with medical providers and counselors to discuss each case on a case-by-case, -case individualized basis and make determinations about how to continue or not. So currently we have 45 active patients, and those are patients who are receiving buprenorphine and also going to the twice-weekly groups. Um, and then um, in the last year, we've served 167 patients. So many of those patients um, are folks who have sort of graduated from our um, initial more intensive treatment and now are on maintenance with either the primary care provider or they're doing maintenance and some other type of counseling or um, or groups that they're going to. Um, and so just to give you kind of a background, this really speaks to, I think, the, the increasing demand for um, medication-assisted treatment. Um, we started our program um, in 2013, and we just started with one counselor and a couple prescribers. Uh, and now we've, we've set, uh, since expanded to um, you know, a much larger team of three counselors, a clinical supervisor, and administrative assistant to deal with um, all the, you know, prior authorizations and managing the refills and things like that. And then we have eight prescribers. Um, so we're really trying to expand um, as much as we can to kind of meet that demand. Um, so now we can talk a little bit about some of our response to the challenges that Barbara mentioned before. And these are some of our responses. Um, 
Okay, yeah, uh, addressing stigma, changing language and culture around addiction, which has really been regarding what was talked about a little bit already, but the way we talk about addiction, I mean, the first one of the first things we addressed was that we were calling it a suboxone program, and um, that leads with the medication, it sends the message that the medication is the most important thing. So we've you know, change some of that sort of language, talk about medication-assisted treatment. When we're talking about clients doing well or success in the program, we want to talk about how the intervention is affecting the diagnosis, not about how compliant or non-compliant a person is. That helps to reduce stigma. And so we also think it's pretty important to have um, pretty strict uh, monitoring guidelines and practices. Um, even as we develop individualized treatment plans, we still have these standards that we need to um, abide by. Um, and so those are things like, you know, pill counts, urine drug screens. Um, we do a treatment agreement when everyone starts, you know, and it, um, starts the program, um, just letting patients know what to expect. Um, and then the twice weekly group is required. Um, so basically, if you don't come to the group, then you, you know, you potentially don't get your prescription that week, or you, if you don't come, you have to meet with a counselor before you get your prescription that week to talk about why you missed it. Um, and then we, um, I'll just jump down to say the, uh, the on-site pharmacy is a huge um, really benefit for us because we work really closely with them and collaborate with them on um, particularly dispensing of medications. We have um, different ways of dispensing the medications to help decrease diversion so we can bubble pack the medications or put them in these special um, plastic packaging so that, you know, each day has, has the medication in it so we're able to monitor that. Um, we have the ability to do daily dispense for a small amount of patients. We try not to do that, um, but we, we can. Uh, generally, we do a weekly dispense. Um, uh, regarding housing, we do have five rooms available for, uh, for patients who are in our program, um, and I think this ties with some other uh, initiatives about housing and some recommendations that there, we really could use uh, greater access to housing options for people who are in medication-assisted treatment. So much of the alcohol and drug-free housing does not recognize medication-assisted treatment, and that's a hurdle still to be jumped. And then the other wraparound services, I mean, I feel blessed often every day to be working for an agency that has a lot of these services on site or within the agency, but mental health, case management, we have social workers that um, we can help with a variety of things. We have a benefits department that helps people get their benefits established, employment, access, and housing. Um, all these things may not happen right away, but at least we have an inroad within the agency you don't have to refer out. And then um, I'll just lastly mention um, provider education because that can be a barrier um, as far as not having appropriate um, addictions training for uh, medical providers. And so we really strive to have frequent education sessions about substance use disorders, uh, also um, you know, education sessions around medication assisted treatment. We have a number of our providers who are um, have received their um, specialist training in addiction medicine, and that's it, physicians and nurse practitioners. So we really are looking forward to um, nurse practitioners and PAs being able to prescribe. Um, and then we also have naloxone training and prescribing here, um, which certainly is uh, important. Okay, that's what we got. Great, thank you so much uh, to uh, both Portland and Baltimore. Um, so let's talk a little bit more openly and get a discussion going. Um, there's been a number of questions that have rolled in about what this looks like and under what conditions we provide care or when do we stop treatment. And so uh, fortunately we've anticipated some of those questions. So when we talk about an approach to care, uh, can you talk a little bit more about what that looks like when you couple the counseling with the therapy? What does being patient-centered and flexible mean? And under what conditions would you stop treatment? So um, for now, why don't we start with Baltimore on this, and then um, we'll move to Portland and, and see uh, if you have anything to add. OK, um, that's the first question is, 
And that implies that medication is coupled with counseling and therapy. And do you, okay, so y'all want to know, uh, do some patients do well on medication alone? I, I totally, as, as a clinician, don't feel that clients do well on medication alone. I don't think they need to have, to have therapy or counseling and develop a treatment plan. I feel like medication alone is just uh, we're taking care of some of the symptoms, maybe one of the symptoms, but the client still may be homeless, still may need other things, employment. Uh, they may need to get back with their family. It's a lot of barriers that these, that these clients are having. So I, I don't think medication alone is going to help a client 100%. But that's one. That's that's just how I feel about that. Uh, yeah, I think I, I, the only the only time I've seen medication alone work, it hasn't been in at, at healthcare for the homeless. It's been in a different setting um, where people have their other needs are pretty much locked down, and that and that might be the only thing that they have going on. It, then and only then does it. So I think medication has medication alone has a chance of working. But here in a, with, with the homeless population, there's just too many other things in their lives. In, in terms of being patient-centered and flexible, um, every week, Terry and I are going to get ready for our, our, our session tomorrow. There's, there's, always, there's always something, right? Like there isn't, uh, there isn't stability in the patients that we're seeing. Um, and so it really is taking into consideration their accounts. Um, accounts of what's happened over the course of the week and I mean, Terry can say like you know just a few things that we encounter. Uh, one of the things what the being patient centered mean and, and one of the things that I try to work with the client is that they become stable and that they like we empower our clients. We want we want them to be able to do things on their own and come up with their own treatment plan, come up with uh, ideas of how they should uh, be doing in treatment and uh it's kind of hard with our population, again, because we deal with a, a, a vast majority of our clients are homeless and don't have any stable place to go, don't even have family members that are supportive. So it's kind of difficult, really, but we still strive toward that in our treatment plans and our treatment goes is to have them become, have them become stable and that they figure out what they want to do. We've been like short-term goals. What is it they want to do? Not what we want them to do. What do they want to do? And I think that's, that kind of works for some of our clients, but again, it's getting them stable. That's the most important part to that part to that question. And I can go on with that last one. What condition will we stop treatment? It's usually when they get bogus urines, or uh, I, I wouldn't use the word stop treatment. Uh, I hate to even use that word stop. Usually, what we'll do is refer them out to another treatment center, sometimes to a long, to an inpatient treatment, or. Now, the one condition that we don't have, if a client is not taking their Suboxone if, or, or they bute, if they come up with bute negative, then, of course, we stop treatment immediately for that, but not drug treatment. We may stop the, the buprenorphine, but we don't stop. We, we still encourage the client to continue on with treatment. Maybe you didn't need the bute and you was doing other things with the bute, so we don't really stop treatment. We just, we just move on to something different and something better. Thank you. And I'm curious, Portland, um, folks in Portland, do you have anything to, uh, to add to that or a way that you do it that's different? Sure. I mean, I think um, I'll say a couple things and I'll let Brian jump in. Um, we mostly feel similarly. Um, you know, we feel like um, the medication is really never enough for our population. I, I can't really think of anyone that I've treated where, you know, just the buprenorphine was enough. Um, I really look at the medication as something to help in stabilization of the patient, so help to stabilize their brain chemistry and, and um, sort of decrease a little bit of the chaos in their lives so they can really see clear to start that journey to recovery. And their recovery journey really um, begins when they enter treatment and they go to groups and they have their counseling sessions and they work on their you know, mental illness and um, and develop community supports, and so I really see the medication as helping in stabilizing the patient, but really not being enough um, enough of the treatment alone. Um, I'll jump down to the third question as far as when do you stop treatment, and again, we also kind of hate that um, concept of stopping treatment. We really try to do everything we can to uh, work with patients to um, 
sort of moving them along on their journey to work on in their recovery journey. Um, you know, if it ever comes to the point where we need to stop prescribing, um, we always refer to a higher level of care. We always give options and refer to treatment elsewhere, you know, whether it be daily dispense elsewhere or if they need to be in methadone maintenance program. Um, so we, we never sort of leave people high and dry. We always do a really humane taper if we need to. Um, you know, conditions when we would stop treatment where it's kind of non-negotiable would be of any evidence of diversion that we have. Um, and really, if the, if the risks of therapy outweigh the benefits, um, so if they're using benzos or alcohol in addition to their Suboxone, that's really a dangerous combination. And continuing along on that path would not be safe. Um, so, you know, an issue of safety is that when, is, is when we let stop. Um, also, and maybe Brian can speak more to this, is, is when they're not really making um, improvements in their treatment plan, you know, so, uh, you know, a month from the time they start, they're not really kind of, um, from the goals that they've set forth, they're not really meeting them, or they're not making really any progress towards those goals. If, if that's sort of a continuous pattern, then that's when we might say, okay, well, this treatment program is really not working for you. Let's figure out what treatment program might. Um, anything to add, Brian? Um, yeah, I would say that I agree with all of the above. I think patient-centered and flexible, uh, and Perry really covered that, um, except that, I mean, and in agreement, I say that we talk to the client, with the client, about what their goals are, and then understanding that to be homeless or to be at risk of homelessness or involved in a multiple multitude of services means that that really is a full-time job for a lot of people just to get food and get all their needs met. So flexibility is really important. We have groups that go throughout the day, you know, and um, different times, different days, and we really can be flexible. We just want to have a care plan that's going to be successful, um, you know, allow them to make progress. I think another important thing to mention is that we do know that addiction is a disease, and one of the reasons it is a disease is because it changes the structure of the brain. And so medication, until they have a medication that, that fixes that structure of the brain, what we have is medication that helps, but the behavioral health part of it, the counseling, is necessary. Maybe there's somebody who doesn't need the counseling piece, but we wouldn't know that unless we talk with them. And talking with them is assessing them, and that's the beginning of treatment. So we wouldn't know until after treatment if they can go on and have just the medication alone. Got it. Thank you for, for that. I know we're, we're running uh, short on time and want to have a couple more um, issues to discuss. Diversion has been an issue that has been in the news a lot, in the public policy discussions, as well as reflected in a number of the questions that have come in. So I'm curious your perspectives on how diversion figures into all, all of the, the issues you've been talking about in terms of self-treatment or risks and, and all the like. So um, I guess we'll, we'll go back maybe to, to Baltimore and see what, how you address some of these diversion pieces uh, just in a, in a minute or two, and then we'll see if Portland has anything to add. So yeah, <laughs> diversion is a diversion is a difficult one because um, I think our, our suspicion is that it, it's not somebody is diverting or they're taking their meds. There's usually a combination of the two. Um, they're taking most of it, they're diverting some of it. Um, and, and realistically, at the end of the day, our goal is to make sure that they're treated and they're doing well. And it's really hard to it's really hard to emphasize the diversion part of it while still being patient-centered and focusing on their care. And so we, we've, we've kind of taken the approach around a more harm reduction approach, which is that as long as you're taking it and you're improving, we're not going to sit here and be your parole officers. Um, at the same time, please don't give us urines that are, that are negative for VUP and then tell us a story about how that, you know, that's not true. Um, and the other thing is that you know, there is, there is, people are buying people on the street. It's, frankly, it's going to be safer than the heroin they're buying on the street or the oxycodone they're buying on the street. Um, and from a, from, 
just from a clinical perspective, the number of people who, who have come in asking for treatment for buprenorphine because they started buying it on the street and they found that it was helping them, I think it's a strong, it has had a strong pull on me in, in kind of thinking about the, thinking about how people are treating themselves because there are no treatment options. Um, so, so diversion is a concern, but it, it's almost like there's a side benefit from the diversion um, in watching people self-medicate and self-medicate, frankly, in a better way than they have. I know that's not the most popular position in the world, um, but it's what we see. Uh, well, my, my take on that, and I, I agree with Dr. Okay, and to a certain extent, but my only problem with the self-treatment with the Suboxone and the Butte is that is the fact that now they're finding ways to melt this, the strips and, and shoot them. Yeah, and, 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 and mainline them, and that's, that's a problem, too. That, that could become very dangerous, and that's a risk uh, uh, of them still ODing. So uh, I'd rather for them to come in treatment than to do that. Again, we know that some people are, are actually selling theirs, and they're taking it. And again, I, like Dr. K say, um, we got some that come in with negative abuse, and they give us a whole hum story of how that happened, and they don't know how that happened. and so. That, it's a catch-22 on that, you know. I mean, I know that's a problem, but again, I kind of agree that that's not that bad of a problem because at least if they're doing it properly, at least they're getting some kind of medication. Of course, we know that there's a criminal aspect to that. You get caught selling or buying, you can be arrested. So that's that's the other risk that you're taking to. I'm curious to know at Portland uh, on the issue of diversion, um, additional perspectives on this? Yeah, so um, I agree with both of those perspectives. It's a it's a really challenging issue. Um, so, you know, just to speak to Terry's point is that we always prescribe, unless there's some um, contraindication to um, prescribing the combination buprenorphine with the naloxone, so that um, if it is um, injected, then the naloxone component becomes active and would block any of the opioid effects. So that's one um, way to sort of um, uh, uh, decrease the likelihood of somebody um, injecting the medication. Uh, but, you know, I, um, I would tend to uh, agree that I would prefer that there be buprenorphine out on the street and people buy that than the oxycodone that I prescribe or, or something else just because there's a decreased um, risk of, of overdose with the buprenorphine. Um, so it is, diversion is definitely something that, um, we um, are concerned about. We, we have all the monitoring um, parameters in place that I talked about because we want to make sure that we're making this medication safe for our patients. Um, diversion is um, one of the things that we monitor for through like, drug screens and pill counts and things like that. But again, we're, we're not trying to be the police officers. We're not the detectives. We're, we're really um, trying to focus on, um, on the patient and, and, and their treatment. And um, we know that it happens. Um, and when it does happen and we have proof of that, we do stop prescribing, but we don't um, let that consume us to the point where we're not really focusing on other things that can really improve the treatment of our patients. So. Thank you. Um, final discussion um, question is the benefits to, to medication-assisted treatment. And it may seem obvious to us, uh, but there's a lot of discussion about what this looks like. And, so I'm curious, uh, Portland, do you just want to keep going with your thoughts on what the benefits to, to Matt are? Sure. Um, so all of these these bullet points here that are listed are um, are obvious benefits that we see. You know, and I, I talked about the increased stability that I see in, in my patients, and um, it's almost like night and day. You know, it's a different patient. If I've never met the patient outside of their addiction. Uh, and then they get started on buprenorphine, they get into our program, it's almost like I'm meeting, a, I'm meeting the person for the, the first time um, when I see them um, engaged in their recovery. It's a really wonderful thing to see. Um, you know, they become stable so they can, um, you know, apply for their benefits or, you know, uh, start working if, if that's something that they can and want to do. Um, and uh, it's really wonderful to kind of see patients be able to stabilize the addiction part um, and then be able to um, really pursue other things in their life that um, could give them joy and fulfillment. Um, they, you know, are able to reconnect with family and um, potentially develop, you know, better, more um, positive social support. Um, and so all the things that are listed here, we really see 
um, in our folks who are able to be successful in our treatment. And I'll just add that for clients who have tried multiple other ways of putting opiates or other substances, um, they've a lot of times really lost hope and this is, you know, something that they're going to try but they don't feel real confident about this. And when to see them actually get stable um, and find a way, it's much more um, successful the first time than I would say other forms of treatment. I mean, there's, it's, it works and it's great to see people renewed with renewed confidence that they can actually restore their lives. Mm -hmm. And Baltimore, curious, um, shared perspectives there? Well, I want to give an example of a client that I have that uh, came in, uh, heroin addicted, uh, living in a shelter, uh, seemed hopeless. And, and, and um, he really didn't have any stability or anything. Uh, he was married, has two children. Uh, we got him on Suboxone. Uh, the client is now stable. Uh, his wife has take, taken him back home. He's in uh, training for getting a CDL's license. Uh, he's helping his kids get back into school as far as helping them with the school clothes and work. So benefit to him was that he was able to reunite with his family. He was able to go to a, a job training program, and he's back with his children. So it does work. Uh, that's a good example of how you can use this to your advantage and that and it works for you uh, and, it, and it covers all these bases it covers the fact that he's a cane stable he's back home he's no longer in the um, shelter and he's engaged in, in an employment program where he become employable and he's already had three job offers he presented them to me and he now has three job offers in driving trucks uh, he has been drug tested they know that and of course I wrote him a letter he had, they know that he's on Suboxone. They know that he's stable on Suboxone. He's not taking a dose that's too high or too low. The dose is just right. You would never know this young man is on Suboxone. So there's a lot of benefits to it. And so if it's administered correctly and if the client really wants to improve, he's a perfect example of how it can be done. Thank you. That's, I think that's a really great way to, to close our formal uh, presentation with that kind of inspiring client example. So thank you, Terry. Um, we've got so many questions that rolled in, and I think part of this really attests to the interest in the field on this issue. So I assure you we will be having additional webinars on this topic, so please look for that in the future. We've got a few minutes to address a couple of the questions that have come in. Uh, and I'll start with one here. Um, what are the two most significant things that you would say to get providers to buy in and start using uh, this type of treatment in their practice. Uh, maybe we'll start with Portland and what advice you get uh, give to the community on, on kickstarting a program like this. Well, let's see. I would probably want to know a little bit more about why the providers are giving the pushback on it. You know, um, because um, we've seen mostly nothing but positive um, benefits um, for patients um, from this treatment. You know, um, just going back to the slide that we just had, you know, it, it, it really helps to stabilize our patients and um, it also helps our patients be able to focus on their other physical health issues. So, you know, I've had folks who just, you know, they're sort of chronically no showing for appointments, their A1Cs are through the roof, um, they're not getting um, their preventative screening, all these things that primary care providers may care about because they're, you know, um, being maybe um, judged on the quality of their care based on, you know, how many of their patients have an A1C less than such and such and how many colonoscopies they, they can get their patients to do. So really it can benefit um, providers in that way and, and your patients become more adherent, they come and see you more, they, they tend to, um, you know, take better care of their other um, ailments. Um, you know, I think, um, yeah, I know that prescribing chronic opioids um, and chronic pain is a, is a significant issue and it, it takes a lot of emotional um, energy and time as a clinician, as a primary care provider. Um, and 
buprenorphine can be used to treat those folks who also have an opioid use disorder, um, and, it, and it can help to um, get patients off of higher dose, doses of their opioids. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can, there's just a long, long list of, of positives that I would probably go through, but I'd want to know maybe what the, um, you know, what the hesitation is from a, from a provider and why they wouldn't want to get started on this. Um, I know we're coming down to the wire on our hour, and so uh, let's just try to squeeze in one more question, and I'll direct this at Baltimore. Uh, am I right that buprenorphine alone can help reduce risk of HIV and hepatitis C? And is there any role of meds alone in a harm reduction capacity for patients who are too unstable for patient participation? So two questions there. One, yeah. um, in terms of the view reducing HIV and hepatitis C, if it's if it's reducing the risky activities, so generally you're talking about um, either injection drug use or, or risky sex that happens either to get money or because of the drug use itself, it's going to, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that I'm aware of studies from that, but it, it makes sense to me. Um, for the second question of harm reduction of buprenorphine only, um, you know, that's sort of like saying that we're going to treat diabetes with diet only, but your A1C is really high. You can do that. It's not a really good idea, though, right? It's not offering the, it's not offering a proper treatment plan. In very, I, I've probably done it a couple of times with really strict guidelines, which is that you have to, you can try it your way, and this is where we get back to patient-centered. We can try it your way, but then you're going to have to succeed your way. Um, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, let's give it a go. And I've seen it work um, zero out of two times. Um, but, but it's a way to engage somebody and say, we tried it your way. Now we're going to, now for me to continue, we're going to have to try it the way that I think is best. And so I almost see it as an engagement tool and less as a, oh, yeah, this is a great idea. Um, but you have to be willing to put that time in to, and, and to see it that way for it to work out that way. Thank you. Um, I think, again, just the, the robustness of the material that we have to present, the number of questions, we're at our hour. Uh, this is a big topic, and so we will continue to come back to this. I'd really just like to thank all of the participants today. Uh, Dr. Kaliana Rama and Terry uh, from in Baltimore, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Sesterczyk and, and Brian in Portland, thank you for sharing your expertise. Uh, really appreciate everybody coming today. I uh, do want to remind everyone that this recording will be available in a few days and emailed to anyone who has registered for it. Um, and please, at the close of this, um, there will be a survey and an evaluation. Please let us know your thoughts, uh, in, I would assume, um, in addition to more time to answer your questions. So we will be having uh, more of these events. We have logged your questions, and we will frame that into another event. Again, thank you so much for coming today. And at this point, um, we will wish you a good afternoon.